So Mr. Thomas Rhett on iHeartRadio, the last time I got to talk to you was another album release and we had a massive party in Toronto. And yeah. I hope that we get to do that with this record at some point. I hope so too. I hope so too. It's, I feel like it's been so long since we've gotten to travel outside of our daggum borders. Uh, so I, I cannot wait to come up there. It's going to be awesome. Do you think when you go back out on the road, are you going to get the bus big enough set up for the whole family to come with you? <laughs> we have thought about it and tossed it around. And, and uh, you know, this year we've definitely picked certain weekends for the kids to come out. But like Willie Gray's in kindergarten and it's um it's not as acceptable anymore to, for, to take her out of school now right. that she's in kindergarten because it's kind of like the first real year of school for her. So once the summer hits, I guarantee you they'll come out quite a bit. Yeah. That'll be so much fun. So sixth album, where we started. When I listened to this record, my husband and I sat there and we were talking about all your albums and we both said, I've never listened to a Thomas Rhett album that from start to finish is not just incredible. And wow, thank you very much. Uh, this one is 15 songs, which makes me so happy because I truly miss the lengthy full albums. What was it about this one that you just felt because you kind of have been releasing a few projects here and there, but this one just felt right for right now for you? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're, we are about to release so much music. It's like, I mean, from from the record we released last year to this one, I think we're going to try to release one more uh, before the end of this year, which is We Country Again Side B, which is what I thought this was going to be uh, until I got back on the road. I mean, I, I, I blame it on my uh, lack of context, honest, honestly, because I think Country Again Side A was written in the dead center of a pandemic. And, um, you know, if anyone was partying, that's great for them, but I definitely was not. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was dadding, you know, full time. And so that's, that's kind of where that string of songs came from. And then when I started getting back on the road, I'd written a whole lot more songs like Country Again Side A that I thought was going to be on Side B. But when I got back on the road and I was like, okay, we're going to be touring in 2022, I think people are ready to just to rage. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and, and not that this album is nothing but party songs, but I, I just, I went back in and tried to just kind of restructure a little bit. And the next thing my restructuring did was it turned into 50 or 60 songs that did not feel like side B for me. Um, and so there was someone at the label said, well, why do we have to put side B out next? And I was like, well, you know, after A comes B. And, uh, and it was like, no, we can, we can do this. You know, we can, I think it's okay to put a middle album out, um, especially if the music is good. And so I, I really put my stamp on all these songs and thought that it was a project that needed to be heard, you know, um, and going on tour, I, I had a lot of songs that I wrote with my live show in mind and, and it all just kind of made sense. Um, and so I think it's gonna be really, really fun. Whoever that person is that works on your record label, I love them. I'm so glad they <laughs> said put out another album. <laughs> Thinking about going back out on the road, because like you said, this album is a good mixture of, you know, there's songs that will literally make you cry like you love to do to us when we're listening yeah. to an album of yours. But there is the fun party songs. And was there one that, you know, when you were writing, because it's been a minute since you've been out on stage, that as soon as you finished it, you knew this one's going to be so fun to play live. Yeah, it was the day that I wrote this song called Half of Me, which features my buddy Riley Green. Uh, I wrote that song in Ohio and I actually went out on stage and played it the same night that we wrote it. And uh, remembering that the crowd's reaction, I was just like, OK, let's do more. Let's do more like this because this is just fun. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it, I, I love songs that allow you to not have to think for a second so that when a song comes along, that you do have to think your mind is clear to think about it. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, I think I was just nervous about just over heavying everyone on top of everyone already being overly heavy. Does it make sense? Yep. Um, yeah. Because Country Against Side A was was a pretty pretty heavy album content wise, you know, and and there's definitely some of those on here, you know, like The Hill and and uh, and Angels and uh, Death Row for sure. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I, I think a lot of these songs still have meat, but they they groove and they vibe, and I and I think they're just songs that you want to put on while you while you cook your dinner, but also songs you want to get out to a, an arena and just jump around and go crazy. So I'm, I, uh, I think there's a really great mixture of, of emotion on this album. For sure. And I think I talked to you about that with your last record and I thought, oh, these are, it's a collection of all of our, our favorite sides of Thomas Rhett on one record. But now what I'm learning is that there are different sides to you and all your albums, you know, have that encompassed into one because you know, yeah. you're not just the guy that's going to sing a sad song. You're also going to party and rage and sing yeah. songs like Death Row um, with Tyler Hubbard and Russell Dickerson that, you know, are 
about something in your life that you experienced that was heavy. What made you, because that is a topic that no one has really sang about and you actually went and experienced it for yourself and then wrote about it. Yeah. Why do you think that song was so important to put on this record? I, I, I would attribute that song entirely to my friends and my family because when I wrote that song, uh, I was just glad to get it off my chest and that was it. Like I, I didn't plan on putting it on a record. I didn't plan on anyone ever really hearing it. Uh, but I remember being, I remember driving to duck camp in Arkansas, hanging out with one of my buddies and I was just playing him a bunch of demos, you know, songs I thought were cool. And, and I stumbled across an email that had uh, the demo of death row in it. And I said, God, I haven't heard this since the day we wrote it, you know, and uh, I played it for him and he goes, that's not going on the record. And I was like, nah, probably not. And he was like, why? And I was like, well, I don't really know how to explain it. Um, it's kind of controversial. Um, and I, I don't know that I want to talk about it. You know, and he was like, dude, I think that I think there are people in the world that need to hear this. And he became one of hundreds of people that said the same thing, because then I started asking for opinion. You know, I was like, should I put this on the record? And everybody that I played it for was like, you have to. And I'm glad I did, you know, because I think it sparked some pretty interesting conversation just on just on the act of forgiveness, not not necessarily in that realm, but even with ourselves and yeah. uh, on the Internet or, or people that are getting freaking canceled left and right. It's just like man, are we perfect to, to be able to say anything about anybody? And the answer is no. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, obviously, death row is an extreme because that is like, you know, those folks have committed something that is uh, in, in many in many minds completely unforgivable. And, and I also can't put myself in the shoes of someone who has lost someone from someone like that. Right. And so I, I have no argument for that. You know, I just know that when I went in there, I basically went in judging a book by its cover and left feeling very changed, feeling that everyone everyone deserves just a, a look over, you know what I'm saying? Like, like not to walk in and be like, I know what you are. I know what you did. And that is what you will always be. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I felt so much remorse when I was in there, you know, especially from those guys that were in there and it just uh, made me look at my life a whole lot different, you know, it so. made me look at even cause I found it was difficult when I first saw you release the song. I was like, how do I talk about this on air with not, yeah. you know, it being too heavy or too controversial. And it yeah. really made me go and look more into that and read up on it and educate myself because it is something we just never think about. So I think yeah. it was an important song to put on that record. I'm glad you did. And well, thank you. And collaborations, obviously, on this record, we've talked about you have Riley Green on here, Tyler and Russell, who I know are also just good friends of yours, truly. Yeah. And then title track of the song where we started such a cool vibe to it. And then you. you throw Katy Perry on there. So how did that come together with her? Long story short, the, the song was not supposed to have a feature on it at all. And when we, when we got the mix back, there was someone at the label that suggested that we maybe try to put a feature on the song. Uh, Cause it, it does feel a little bit more progressive than any of the other tracks on the record, you know? And I think if you're going to go there, you might as well just go there. And yeah. um she suggested, she was like, I want to send it to Katy Perry. I just had this feeling that she's going to like this. And I didn't really believe her because I, I truly thought there was just no way that was going to happen. Also, yeah, let me just throw a Katy Perry collab like on the album. You know what I'm saying? Um, but when she responded, she responded with such like umph on the song. Like you just loved it and fell in love with the story of the song, the production, the the cinematicness of the song. And, you know, the next thing I know, we're I'm FaceTiming Katy Perry in the kitchen and we're you know, she's talking about what part she wants to put on the song. And then we shot a music video, finally met each other in person. Um, and now we're talking about, you know, when we're going to perform it, perform it on television or when she can come out to a tour date and perform it. And uh, just a very act of God, like truly, because it, it wasn't supposed to, to be that way. So. So cool. I mean, just casually FaceTiming Katy Perry in the kitchen. Right. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, I remember, I remember talking to her and I was like, I was saying something. I was like, yeah, sorry. I mean, my kids are kind of running around. My wife's in here. She was like, oh, yes, it's it's all good. My my, my fiance sitting right here. His name's Orlando Bloom. And I was like, oh, cool. Hi. <laughs> hey there. Tell him I said, what's up? You know, like <laughs> love Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Congrats on this record where we started. Obviously, can't wait to listen to the full thing live because I feel like after you've been cooped up for a few years, you're going to need to get back out on stage and yeah, let it sure. all out. <laughs> so absolutely thank you for joining us on iHeartRadio, Thomas Rhett, and hope we get to see you and have you back in Canada soon. Talk to you later. See you. Yeah. Have a good one.